here in the Annie's for a long time. I'm glad we finally got to be here. And it's all for space, isn't it? And we all fit very well. There are seats. Um, it's nice and cozy. Come on up. Um, and just to echo uh, Manny, like, you know, it's okay to get up and get it during the thing. This is, this is casual event, so. Um, appreciate everyone being here. Um, this is uh, part of a series that we do at Code for America. Contagia who's at the, was one of the people who um, greeted you when you came in, manages them for us, along with Jody, who also helped out, um, and Elizabeth, who is somewhere. Well, there's Elizabeth, hi. Um, so thank you to all of uh, our staff who make these happen. And we have Lizzie and Jimmy also on staff here with us. Um, uh, I kind of figure if you are here, you probably know a little bit about Code for America. But can, can you raise your hand if you're sort of new to the Code for America world? OK, good. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm just going to say a few words about who we are um, to contextualize the conversation that we're about to have. Um, uh, with Evan about his fantastic book. Um, we are a nonprofit. Um, we are based here, but we work nationally. And our vision is that government can work for the American people and by the American people in a digital age. First part of that is that we love, love, love government, but we don't think it works as well as it needs to today. Um, so we really do three big things. Um, we show what's possible by making government services so good that they inspire change in others. We help others do that themselves through a lot of different means. Um, and we are trying to build a movement of people who believe that government can work the way it should in a digital age and are willing to help make it happen. Um, and so some of the stuff that you're going to hear about tonight in terms of regulation is very near and dear to our heart. Um, we kind of feel like we are sort of regulatory hackers. Um, and I just want to give you sort of two quick examples of projects that we do in that first bucket of showing what's possible to kind of change the conversation about how good government could be, can be, is at many times, how many people in government are working to make the services that we provide, particularly for the people who need government the most, how to make them as good as they can be and then inspire others. So um, I, I bring them up because of probably something that we can sort of weave into the conversation later, but uh, one project uh, which we've been doing for a couple of years is um, helping California close the participation gap in food assistance or food stamps. Nationally, it's called SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Here in California, we call it CalFresh. And when we started working in this area with our wonderful friends in the city and county of San Francisco, we found that it's really, really hard to apply for food stamps. Um, online, you can go in person. If you try to apply online, it's a very cumbersome process. It doesn't work on a mobile phone. Um, takes a long time, asks a lot of questions that don't make you feel good about government, make you feel like government kind of assumes that you're a criminal. That's not necessarily the message we want to send. Um, and ultimately resulted in so many people applying but really never getting through the process, uh, which is why California was the second lowest state in terms of participation in SNAP in the entire country. Um, there's a whole lot that our team has done. The most visible piece of this is making an application form that does work on a mobile phone, takes only about seven minutes, allows you to upload your documents, and the text messages back and forth with you to help you through the rest of the process to make sure you actually, if you're eligible, actually get the benefit of food stamps, which is really, really important because it's the program most highly correlated with better health and education outcomes for kids. So this is a good thing for not just individuals, but our whole community. And um, we are actually now, I'm happy to say, um, we've been working county by county across all 58 California counties. And just about two weeks ago, the state finally told the other, let's see, we have, we're up to 50, 42 out of 58 counties, and the state finally told the rest of the counties, um, you all have to do Get CalFresh. You all have to do uh, Code for America's um, application form and process because this is actually the way. This We know that this works. There's so much evidence that supports that everybody has to do it. So that's been a very satisfying project that continues for us um, and is really getting to the kind of change that we look for, which is not just making something a little bit better, but actually changing the system, actually changing how it works. Um, the second project is about uh, clearing people's criminal records. Um, we have had a couple of propositions here in California that purported to allow you to take an old felony off your record so that you could get jobs, you could get student loans, you could get housing. But we didn't really think about the implementation of it. And we've been working through a couple of ways, and we'll go into the, all, the whole history of it, but actually um, a couple of ways to just make government good on its promise 
we said that that should come off your record, but it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And our fantastic team, our criminal justice uh, group here at Code for America, is actually we're about to make some announcements. So I won't, you know, I won't ruin my won't ruin the announcement today. But we're about to make some announcements about the ways in which we've actually been able to do that automatically, so that we don't we're not putting the burden on individuals in our society for having to go through a 10 step process that takes years and many, many dollars, tens of dollars that people don't have, um, we just actually remove these burdens from people's records. So that's the kind of work we do at Code for America and I think it's a, um, a good setup. We really believe that we're not gonna change our society at scale if we don't have government involved. And that's why we were so excited about Evan's book because he's also taking really seriously and thoughtfully and intelligently um, the role of government in what we're trying to do as businesses, as a society, and um, there's so many parallels that I won't continue to talk about it because my wonderful board member <coughs> and husband, <laughs> Tim O'Reilly, has graciously agreed um, to, uh, to, to, to share a little bit about his experience with um, reading Evan's book and, and, and draw out at some of Evan's really thoughtful learnings here. So please welcome my husband, Tim O'Reilly. And also welcome, Evan Brofield. Mm -hmm. so, by way of introduction, uh, I first met Evan when he was running uh, uh, sort of a, a, an incubator uh, venture capital fund called 1776 in Washington, D.C. Uh, very successful, but because they were in Washington, D.C., but also because of Evan's uh, particular leanings, you tended to invest in a lot of of very civic-minded projects, and uh, that was sort of part of the background that led you in the direction of writing this book. Uh, but let's sit down and uh, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about it. Um, and I, I wanted to actually start with the, you know, a place where some people may not understand the point of the book. Uh, in fact, we, we just saw on Twitter, uh, actually it was, it was some old tweets from when it came out where people were going, oh, this is all about um, you know, the kind of thing that Uber and Lyft did uh, by sort of running roughshod over um, uh, taxi regulations, and this is a handbook for how to do that. And that was what a bunch of people seemed to think it was about. What's it really about? Yeah, no, it's not, it's not uh, <laughs> how do you um, get government out of your way, um, necessarily. Um, it's, it's, the premise of the book really starts with the idea that um, more and more startup activity um, is going to be focusing in on industries and markets that are really qualitatively different than the ones that startup activity has tended to focus on. And that when you start to get really deep, not into just, um, you know, how do I do a calorie counting app, but when you really get into clinical workflows in a health setting, when you really want to transform how uh, energy works in this country, when you want to uh, make government work in a, in a different way for citizens. Um, if you want to transform food uh, uh, production and distribution, regulation isn't incidental to these markets. It's absolutely central to these markets. And it's what creates the incredible complexity that as an entrepreneur, as an as a investor back in the entrepreneurs, you have to navigate. And I, I've seen so many startups uh, that I've worked with over the years that are trying to very earnestly trying to apply kind of the classic, uh, you know, Silicon Valley narrative about how you build a startup that maybe worked great for dating apps. It is actually the, the exact wrong advice to be taking if you're trying to transform uh, food production. Um, and that's what the book is designed for. It's, it's, you know, we do get into things like if you genuinely feel like you are confronting um, rent seekers that have achieved regulatory capture and the only strategy you have is to fight, fight well, but by and large it's a book about how do you work with and collaborate with government and more importantly, how do you build business models, how do you think about growth, how do you think about the journey of building a startup when you're operating in these kinds of, of complex markets. Yeah. You also talk, I, I thought it, the book is, is full of stories, you know, it's very well done that way in the sense that you don't talk theory, you talk stories and then you draw lessons from the stories. And the very first story you open the book with is about a government regulation that saved your life and how it actually got there. 
Can you maybe share that story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll start with the fact that this government regulation saved my life because um, I was a dumbass. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so classic sort of founding story. I was up, I probably had worked like 36 hours straight um, on something and was super, super exhausted. And I drove home. And at the time, I lived in a, a small condo thing. And um, the garages were sort of off to the side underneath one of the units, basically. So you have to understand the structure here. And like, I pulled into my garage, and I, um, I think I was listening to music. And I listened to the end of a song. I got out. I walked in, collapsed asleep. Uh, and then like, it, from that deepest, darkest sleep, I noticed my phone was ringing. I finally wake up. My wife was out of, time, out, of time, out of town at the time. And my neighbor's going, Evan, where is Vera? Where is Vera? And I'm like, this, this is like 3 in the morning. I'm like, what's going on? And he goes, well, the fire department's about to break into your garage. Where is your wife? And I, it, it all suddenly dawns on me. I had, I had left the car running yeah. in the garage because I had one of those little key fobs. Yeah. And in theory, it's the car is supposed to turn off if the key fob is too far from the car. It didn't. The car had been running at that point for like six hours. <laughs> And all of the units were like filled with carbon monoxide. And somebody's carbon monoxide alarm went off. Not in my unit, because I was the furthest from it, but somebody's carbon monoxide alarm went off. And I come running out, and the fire department is like with axes about, because they thought my wife was in there. Like that was what they were concerned about. And, the, um, and so it, it's funny, right? It's so the question of, well, why is it that every house has a carbon monoxide alarm? Because punchline, 25 years ago, no houses had carbon monoxide alarms. 15 years ago, no houses had carbon monoxide alarms. And it turns out that um, a company, right, developed a new technology, Kitty Corporation developed a new technology that suddenly made carbon monoxide testing um, super, super cheap. You could now get a little $200 carbon monoxide alarm and stick it in your house. Except nobody was aware of the problem. Nobody knew about the problem. There was no sense of urgency around putting this in place. And so Kitty's regulatory, first regulatory hack, their attempt was, well, let's just go edit to all the building code people, and we'll just get it added to building codes, because this makes total sense, right? $200 device. Sure, less than, much less than that now. Nowadays, yeah, yeah, but at the time, yeah, I mean, it's just, this yeah. is like classic adoption curve. There's still, it was like a, a relatively cheap device could save lives, it's a no-brainer. Well, it turns out that building code organizations in a lot of cities are populated by the, the sort of boards are often populated by people from the building industry um, and the building industry had no interest in adding any cost whatsoever to the cost of a new house even 150 dollars for carbon dioxide and they got kind of stumped at every at every point the regulatory hack and the kind of the lesson i think that i tried to extract out from this is that they took a step back and they really went and thought about the broad power map that they were facing. And they went and they looked at their data. And the key insight they came up with was that kids are actually much more susceptible to dying when there's a carbon monoxide leak in a house. What a reason their systems can't handle it as much. So if a, if a house gets filled with carbon monoxide, a child can usually die first. And so it's one of the leading causes or was for, uh, for childhood deaths. And so they went, well, this is crazy. And they ended up going to build a coalition with um, pediatricians and pediatric, nurse, pedi pediatric nurses. And they ended up turning it into a public health issue, and they got health codes changed to require carbon monoxide alarms in every new construction. And the way they did that, too, which was great, is they actually looked at the rank ordering of states with the highest incidences of uh, childhood death from carbon monoxide. And it turns out a lot of them were in the Northeast because right? you have a lot of heat sources up there that produce this. So they went to, I think the worst was actually like New York State, and they went to New York and said, do you realize more children are dying every year in your state than any other state in the country because of this? And if you just pass this one little rule for $200 per, per new household, you could get this done. They did that, and then they went to the next on the list. And they went, New York just did this. Why do you not care about your kids? And then they went to the third on the list, and then eventually... You know, they got down the last few states going, every other state in the country requires this. What's wrong with you, Arizona? Uh, and then they ended up taking that and they went to Home Depot. And it was a, I'm old enough to remember for a long time, every time you walked into Home Depot, like the display right in front of you, right at the entrance on the end of an aisle was carbon monoxide alarms. 
And that was, again, very much a almost corporate social responsibility campaign for Road Depot as well, right? Like, how do we get these ethical people's hands? And, and to me, there's so many different lessons about regulatory enactment contained in that one story. Um, but I, that's how I sort of wanted to open the book with it, is I felt like it brought out a lot of these interesting themes. Yeah, well, first, of the, uh, maybe the most important one is this idea that everybody kind of says, boy, these regulations, they come handed down from government. And it's actually realizing that, no, actually, they often come from concerned citizens, or they come from companies with an interest in a particular uh, issue. Uh, and so in some sense, understanding a story like that actually can be very empowering for people going, oh, actually, I could influence government. Yeah. A startup go, I can influence government. And also, it, it's a story uh, of, you know, we hear a lot of stories of regulatory capture. And yes, Kitty and many others benefited from this, uh, this initiative, but it was fundamentally a pro-social act. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's, uh, it, it challenges a lot of our, you know, libertarian assumptions in tech, for example, that, uh, you know, government bad, uh, you know, private sector good, you know, but private sector wants nothing to do with government. And right. said, no, actually, government here was an incredible lever to achieve a uh, goal at scale. Uh, and actually, you actually, we're going to come back to this later, but you end up your last uh, chapter in the book is, uh, is Elon Musk, the ultimate regulatory actor. You know, it's like because you look at all the things he's done, every single one of them is a... Uh, well, and, and actually to the point, right, I mean, I feel like the, the classic Silicon Valley narrative right now would be, well, we have this technology, let's spend $300 million to go out and market it as quickly as we possibly can. Kitty spent an absolute fraction of that yeah. to execute this regulatory hacking strategy. Right? They were very thoughtful. They were very strategic. They understood their power map. They applied yeah, you're data. Using that term power map, maybe, has everybody, has everybody heard that? Yeah, maybe you explain what you mean by that. So yes, yeah, so I it's the I like I would joke, right? I hope you um, all buy my book, and I hope you read every chapter. By the way, yeah. <laughs> very very good book. I highly recommend it, and I'm going to pitch you again at the end of the session. But if you were only going to read one chapter, I think this, the the single most important one is the chapter on power because that is. Um, the, the sort of essential insight, I think, to almost everything that flows from it is um, if you sort of read all the lean startup stuff and you read Paul Graham's blogs and you do all this, like, there's this incredible obsession on the customer, right? This is central to the sort of startup journey. Just focus on who your customer is and obsess and obsess about developing them and understanding their needs and wants. And that feels totally right. And there is a lot right about that, except when you get into these complex markets, the reality is that the customer is often only one of a whole giant array of stakeholders that you need to be able to add value to or at least remove as a veto on what you're gonna to do to be successful. And each of those stakeholders is often influenced by a whole range of other people who have power over them. And actually, the term power mapping comes from sort of social justice theory, political stakeholder theory, and it's why I sort of brought it in. But you shouldn't be accidental about that. Like, the, almost the most foundational thing you have to do if you are going to try to scale a startup in a complex, highly regulated market is, is systematically and continuously understand the full power map that you're facing. And that's going to end up driving, should you uh ask permission or beg forgiveness should you use this spot as a business model or a different business model um whose influence do you need to develop all of that flows from the understanding of your power map yeah and obviously the kitty story is actually a, a very good you know simple power mapping illustration they thought the power was with the uh the building code uh inspectors uh, the building code developers instead it was uh uh, with, with, public, with public health officials. It was both, and, and then extrapolating that, well, who has influence over public health officials? Well, actually, we can go out to pediat pediatricians, pediatric nurses. The other great insight in that is that um, understanding that power map goes, well, actually, this is a great issue if you're a pediatrician or pediatric nurse. It's an issue you can champion around public health that actually doesn't require you to change your business or your behavior <laughs> in one, yeah. one bit. Yeah. Okay, so fully understanding that is where you sort of Figure out where the leverage points lie. So uh, I want to 
jump to, to something. I mean, and so researching for this talk, I came across a tweet from Mark Head, who is actually somebody who we worked with at Code for America uh, in, in our early days. He's a long time, you know, devoted to civic hacker. And he, he brought up an issue back when the book first came out. He said, uh, uh, it was actually responding to somebody else's uh, tweet uh, who, who basically had a picture of the cover of the book. He said, breaking the law. You invented breaking the law. We thought that was what the book was about. And, and Mark uh, and he said, people think that regulatory hacking is some brilliant startup strategy until they realize that predatory lending and gaming the eviction system to monetize poor people are essentially following the same playbook. And, you know, how do you respond to that? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the... Um I, I talk a lot in the book about the fact that um, one of the very first things you need to check before you apply any of these techniques is are you genuinely operating in the public interest? Now, that is always open to interpretation. If everyone in America had absolute clarity as to what the public interest is, we probably would have a whole lot simpler set of political processes than we do, right? Um, one person's public interest is that there's another person's nightmare, but by and large, that's different from when you know what you're doing is, is really not necessarily a good thing, not necessarily benefiting everyone, and you're trying to use these techniques for, for bad. I, I think, though, like, I think you can unpack Mark's critique in a number of ways, because he specifically jumped onto, like, the Uber example. Mm -hmm. I actually... Um, and I, I do a pretty extensive breakdown of the Uber case study because I feel like um, you know it's it's the one that Silicon Valley often jumps to and says, oh, we understand how to work with government. Look, Uber showed us. Uber showed us. And you're you're like, and the, and the first point I make is that actually, like, Uber is such an unbelievable outlier. Was such an unbelievable outlier in terms of the strategic landscape they were facing, what their power map looked like, that it's almost the worst possible case study for any other startup to take and apply and go, oh, I'm just going to do an Uber. Um, but the, a bunch of ways, but the, um, one of the essential realities for Uber was um, they really were facing rent seekers that had driven regulatory capture at the local level in all of these cities. And there was, I, I, I still, having thought about it every way I can, um, and uh, Bradley Tusk, who, who did a lot of the early regulatory strategy work for them, he and I debated this back and forth. Like, there was not an ask permission strategy that was going to work for Uber. There, there was not a way in which Uber was going to go to any taxi cab commission and say, hey, we'd like to offer a uh, competing service to your existing taxi operators, which is going to radically change the cost structure, bring a lot of new drivers. No taxi cab commission was going to say, hey, that's awesome. Come on in. Although Lyft, Lyft and uh, Sidecar did back work for the California Public Utilities Commission on a bunch of regulations that yeah. actually paved the way quite a bit for that market. But the the basic idea of sometimes you do have to figure out how to how to how to fight. Right. Uh, where I think the Uber case study is also illustrative is then taking that way way too far and taking the need to fight when 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 you have to to sort of crash into a market and turning that into a virtue that says, great, we're going to ignore government and turn government into sort of the villain in this. And I think there was a lot that Uber now does, they could have done a whole lot earlier to then figure out how to also offer a carrot and collaborate and be a partner to government. Um, but but I think the, um, you know, again, the sort of taking the, the, the statement that sometimes you, you are genuinely facing a captured, corrupt situation, and you're going to have to apply some interesting techniques to break through that and saying, therefore, um, every startup that's attempting to navigate or work with government has to be in conflict with government is, a, I think, a, a, a dangerous misread of how most startups are successful. Yeah, you also unpack uh, the 23 and Me story a little bit, which yeah. is uh, another high-profile one, and you kind of contrast early 23 and Me and late 23 and Me as a uh, kind of an example of, of how they learned from their early missteps and changed their way they were dealing with government. Yeah, and, and also and also started to face a totally different power map. So you know, 23andMe had built this unbelievably impressive network, unbelievably talented team, who everybody they needed to do in Silicon Valley were absolutely convinced that what they were doing was going to transform health. And if you go back and read a lot of the articles from you know five, six years ago, 
it was, you know, 23 and me is going to uh, negate the need for doctors because your all of your health information is just going to come from your DNA test. Um, and and then all of a sudden they got a cease and desist letter from the FDA saying you guys are offering unregulated medical advice. Um, you have to stop immediately, or people will go to jail and you're going to be put out of business. And one of the points that I make is that it turns out that a big forgiveness strategy just doesn't work when you're dealing with the FDA, right? If, if you're you can apply that strategy if you want, if you're dealing with local taxi cab commissions, and the consequence may be some impounded cars and some fines, and you can choose to pay those or not. When the consequence is people go to jail and your business is shut down, like that strategy doesn't. And the interesting part was, you know, 23andMe was funded well enough and had enough backers. They were able to sort of take a step back and say, we'll do the genealogical testing stuff for a while to kind of stay out there. But they did, and they went and really systematically built the influencer networks to say, who do we have to know? What do we have to know? How do we build the right relationships right. in the right way? And I think it was it took them three years, four years, uh, and it was I think what about eighteen months ago that they got the first actual cancer test um, through with them. And now it feels like every month, twenty three me rolls out another actual piece of health advice they can give you from their test, uh, but only after they sort of figured out how you navigate that world. So. You know, I think one of the basic messages that I would sort of bring to that overall discussion is regulatory hacking does not mean you get a free pass on ethics. And I'm thinking about that because, you know, a regulatory hacker that's also in the news right now a lot is, um, uh, you know, the Sacklers, you know, the, the, the company behind uh, the opioid epidemic. Yep. They were also regulatory hackers, yep. but they were clearly doing it against the public interest and for their private interest uh, when they were you know hacking the FDA to get the uh, drug uh, the drug uh, uh, documents to say this is is not very addictive when in fact it was evidence that it was uh, the, you know so I guess the question you know I think we need to separate there's a set of techniques and they can be used uh, by bad guys and they can be used by good guys just like virtually everything else and you know we need to make clear this junction you know hacking government that you know, means uh, understanding how to work with it. I mean, way. I mean, look, I, um, I I am I am fundamentally a Washington D.C. person, born and raised, and uh, I spend much of my life watching how that system works. There's almost nothing in my book that any Fortune 500 company doesn't already know and is not applying massively to keep markets stacked in their favor. You can make a very, very legitimate critique, which I think Mark was making, that hey, maybe we should figure out in the long run how to improve our political system so that's less relevant. In the meantime, by and large, I would much rather that well-intentioned startups have access to those techniques than not. Yeah, I think that, that makes sense. I want to uh, pivot a little bit. You, you have a great quote, which I hadn't heard before. Uh, you, you quote uh, Simon Sinek. And he said, the goal is not to do business with everyone who needs what you have, but to do business with people who believe what you believe. And you put it in the context of framing up the story about why you're doing what you're doing. And I think uh, uh, about that a lot in the context of Code for America. You know, when Jen was talking earlier about Get CalFresh and Clear My Record, they're both attempts to change what people believe about what's possible. I mean, our ultimate government hack at Code for America is uh, showing that something that has traditionally been thought, oh, that's hard, that's expensive. You hire a you know a big uh, you know government contractor and they spend hundreds of millions of dollars and take you know five years or ten years. You know, oh, we just showed you that using you know a small you know startup team, uh, you know machine learning, user experience design, you know we can solve that that problem. Uh, from the outside, show you what's possible, and make system change, and and you know literally they come to believe that something else is possible, and and that um, kind of you you kind of talk about it with a number of, of your uh, of the startups that you talk about. You talk about Seamless Docs, uh, there are a number of others where they basically you know were ultimately changing the narrative as part of their. Well, and I think that, um, I mean, I, there's an entire chapter of the book just devoted to narrative. And I think it is, it's important for any startup, but it is 
unbelievably important if you are operating in these kinds of complex markets for two reasons, at least two reasons. One is, um, in, in a certain sense, particularly in the early days, your, your, your biggest free asset is that you are genuinely solving the problems that everybody hopes someone is out there solving. Right? And, and, and all the startups in the, in the book, by and large, I think, are doing what we hope entrepreneurs are going to do. Right? They're not going to build yet another dating app. They are going to go transform healthcare. They are going to go um, you know, improve the way government works. They're going to help expunge criminal records. Like they're doing meaningful things. And so you have to make sure you nail that in your narrative. Because in your early days, your ability to gather influence, your ability to get people to listen to you, is going to derive directly from how inspirational that why is at the core of your business. The second reason, though, is that you're operating a complex market, and what you're doing is going to be unbelievably hard to explain because there's a lot of moving pieces that are counterintuitive. And most complex markets are an awful lot um, more nuanced and more difficult than most people understand. And if you don't put the work into your narrative, and you don't figure out how to explain that in a really simple way, it's going to be a giant impediment to what you're doing. And so it's both maximize the value of the inspirational why behind what you're doing and really, really put the work in to not sound like some <laughs> sort of um, you know, policy wonk meets techie trying to explain why what you're doing is actually important and how it works. We actually had uh, a friend of mine who's a former San Quentin inmate was in uh, at Code America this morning. And uh, he, 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 according to Jen, he, he encapsulated this uh, very same advice uh, by saying, what you all doing is dope. Don't make it boring. Yeah. No, dope. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Man. I thought I, that's absolutely. great advice for the civic hacking world. I, I, I hadn't heard, um, I hadn't heard actually when, when Jen was introducing that like, you know, we make government work, you know, by the people, for the people in the digital age. Like that's, probably hours and hours and hours or days and days of refinement or refinement to get to the point of being able to still it, describe it in that simple, clear way that like at least got me immediately that little tingle of like, ah, oh, like, yes, you've got to make sure for your startups that you nail that part of it because um, you're not doing just another uh, thing that's going to hopefully make you money, but who really cares when the day is done? You are doing something that is meaningful and important, and you've got to be able to sort of nail that piece. Of it. Uh, I have lots more things uh, uh, to ask Evan, but I bet you all do too. And so, what I want to do is I'm going to ask him one last question while you uh, think about uh, what you might want to ask. And I, this is a little awkward. We, we don't have a, a mic to hand around. We, we just have a corded mic. We just have a corded mic, and it's a little hard for people to get up here. So but, may, maybe people shout their question, yeah, and maybe, you restate right, it. Yeah, yeah that, that's probably the best thing. So but before, while you're all thinking about what you might want to ask, and so we get into the interactive phase, I want to just take this a little bit away from your book, to what you're focused on now. You, you basically, you said you really have an interest uh, to me when we were talking the other day in startup ecosystems mm -hmm. away from Silicon Valley. You're doing a lot of work with opportunity zones. You're trying to figure out, you know, how we take what we, you know, again, the revitalization of our economy is one of those big complex market uh, questions, and that's something that you seem to be very uh, focused on these days. So maybe you can talk a little bit about where you're going. Yeah, you know, look, I think um, I think these are actually these things are actually being intertwined together. Um, First, I think there is an unbelievable imperative for us to figure out how to make sure that um, talented, ambitious people anywhere in the country can get access to the resources they need to build and scale high growth companies. Um, it is, and I think we're seeing the early stages of just how bad it's going to be for America. If people feel like there's only uh, one or even two or three or four or five cities they have to move to. Um, if they want to be able to sort of um, really make an impact. And I think it's actually bad for those cities that people are moving to, and it's bad for the cities that are leaving. Um, and that's hard work. It's, it's really, really, really hard work. And I think, um, you know, an, an example of sort of, to, to use a different phrase, maybe a policy hack that's enabling that is opportunity zones. Um, and it's a great example of like the, the passage of opportunities, and for those who don't know the background of the story, um, it was actually an organization called uh, the Economic Innovation Group, 
um, really did a lot of the hard work on this stuff, um, which was funded by Sean Parker um, almost entirely. And they developed this and they worked it and they worked it and they worked it. And the, the interesting thing is, I think almost nobody was even aware of the fact that they managed to get it tucked in to the Republican tax law. Um, and on the listing of like everything that was in that law that everyone focused on, like there were probably 50 things that people were talking about, the consequences of state and local taxes, the uh, corporate thing, all this stuff. And like this one little passage in there that says, hey, we are going to enable you to set up funds um, in disadvantaged parts of the country. Um, and if you put capital in these funds and they invest in, in high growth businesses and, and frankly all kinds of businesses, um, you can reduce some of the capital gains taxes on the money you put in there and you can get no, you don't have to pay any capital gains taxes um, on the, the gains if you keep it for 10 years. That's a crazy, crazy tax incentive. Unbelievable powerful incentive. And it was a very classic like, just because they sort of knew how the system worked to be able to sort of get that change through um, and now you're seeing the <laughs> incredible amount of the economy like jumping yeah. to that incentive, responding to it, and we think that's going to be hugely impactful. Yeah. The, the part though, like, I think there's something else in, about this too, which is that other parts of the country have human capital, have networks, have deep expertise in sectors that are centrally important to this broader kind of regulatory hacking thesis. And, and if you go to the Boise, Idaho startup scene, Turns out no one there is trying to figure out how to help you share photos. But there's a whole bunch of how do you use drones and data to drive uh, much better agricultural outcomes using much less fertilizer. Because guess what they know in Boise, Idaho? They know about fertilizer and the actual messy details of what farming involves. Um, in the startup scene in Baltimore, right? You have a ton of healthcare startups because Johns Hopkins and one of the foremost research institutes in the country in these areas. And so I think the getting more and more startup activity focused on problems that are really going to determine the, the world that our kids grow up in and diversifying where our startups are built from are actually um, the same problem looked at from different lenses. And it's something I, I, I'm super, super passionate about because I think it's really important. All right. Uh, anybody out there have uh, a question you want to ask Kevin? Can't we see. Can't have see. someone over there. All right. Shoot. Okay, so I haven't read your book. Um, I probably will. But <laughs> we have a sale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to start off with that. Just um, I have mixed feelings about the way that you're talking about this yep. because, uh, in my mind, I wanted to. To see if you can speak to kind of the impact that this might have. Let's say like a bunch of startups tomorrow uh, go out and put this in practice. One of the things I see issues with in our country right now is an increasingly politicalized uh, government in which even organizations that are typically supposed to be politically agnostic are becoming not so much agnostic. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is what, what kind of pressure would this kind of strategy just put on a you know a system that doesn't really work that well to begin with. Uh, I, I, go, I come from Austin and one of the things that really annoyed me very much was that we were often talking about like the scooters and Uber and all these people coming in with this kind of strategy. I know that's the wrong way to do it, right? But we were talking about like our infrastructure is not working for a city. Our homeless population is like out of control, you know, all these kinds of like actually issues that I see that matter when there's tons of people applying these kind of strategies to you know, that, that don't aren't well intentioned. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the issue is um, how do you deal with the, the, the fact that there are uh, if, if lots and lots of people take Evan's advice uh, and you have more and more startups who are trying to do this, is, you know, is this going to overwhelm governments? And in particular, is it going to overwhelm governments because uh, there are people who are not necessarily well-intentioned doing this? And you use the example of uh, Austin and scooters uh, and, and so on. 
and then how that can detract from the real problems. Yeah, yes, and, and the question is, you know, will this detract from uh, government's ability to solve the real problems? So, um, there's a lot in that question to unpack. Um, one of the very first things he said that I wanted to maybe respond to a little bit, and then I want to jump specifically to the scooter example. Um, so you said, uh, will this politicize government, right? Will having more startups driving more issues like this kind of politicize government when it should be more important to have sort of neutral institutions that are independent of politics? You may consider my answer skeptical of, or cynical in a certain sense, but like, I, I don't think that's possible. I mean, politics is the process through which, in a messy, nasty, whatever process, but it is the politics through which a, a society collectively, and in a hopefully democratic society, determines what its public interest is, determines what public kind of morality in that sense is. What is it that we want to spend money on? What is it not? And so my answer isn't don't equip startups to be very actively out there advocating for new business models and new innovation to get done what they're going to get done. It's I think the country would be better off with a lot more people involved in politics, not less. I, I don't think the problem is that we are not all involved in the political process. I don't think the problem is we're too involved in the political process. I think it's that not enough people are involved in the right way. And I would put startups, like back to my point about I don't just want Fortune 500 companies to be understanding the leverage points and the sophistication involved in crafting the regulatory environment. I want startups. And by the way, I want citizens hugely more involved as well. And, and I work on those same questions. Like what are the regulatory, what are the reforms we need to do to get many more citizens involved? The scooter example. So, so before you go to scooters, let me just sort of add in. There's a really important distinction, which I know Jen has always made as long as I've known her talking about this. And that's the distinction between politics as we think about it as in politicians and voting and politics in the sense that you were talking yeah. about it, which is the involvement of the polis, that is all of us mm -hmm. in uh, the messy push me, pull you of what are we going to do? Uh, because a, a lot of the level at which both Coach America and the, the people that you're talking about are operating is not actually at the level of electoral politics. It's at the level of interacting with the actual, you know, uh, people who are involved in the nuts and bolts of governing our society. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So and on the scooters. Yes. And in that sense, you're right, like, Regulatory Hack is a book, 95% about politics in the, how do we all collectively arrive at decisions, and 5% about those very rare cases where you're literally trying to achieve an electoral outcome to support your startup. But the, um, I think the, the scooters to me are um, a great example. And actually, um, uh, Ron Klain, who works for Revolution, a big venture fund, and um, uh, is, is a, been a long time Democratic political operator, he wrote a great op ed in the Post about exactly that issue about, um, hey, it's great that, that scooters are here, but um, maybe we should focus on. Um, the, the fact that more and more funding, right? The transportation in a city is fundamentally a, a public good, right? Everyone in the city needs to get places. And in fact, the scooters are also symptomatic that we're moving more and more of what should be a public good as a, as a private good, right? Um, that's a really, really good and valid critique. And it's one that a lot of people should be engaging in. And that's why more people should be involved in the political process to put pressure on, on, on their city councils to have that conversation. At the same time, you don't want, like I, I don't want less scooters, I want more scooters, but I want more regulated scooters. The, the way I always describe it, in a, and it sounds trite, but it's, it's true because it plays out in my head over and over again. When I'm like late to a meeting, in, in you guys, now have scooters again in San Francisco, right? They're putting a pause, I think they're back. I, I use this example in New York, everybody looked at me totally blankly, because there are no scooters on the streets in New York, because they are, they're, they're against the law. But in DC, they're freaking everywhere. And when I'm like late for a meeting, and I'm like flying down the street with the wind through my hair, like I feel super cool, like the scooters are the single greatest transportation invention ever. 
three days later, when I'm walking down a sidewalk with my, uh, you know, 18 month old strapped to my chest and my little daddy carrier holding my three year old daughter's hand and some jackass 25 year old hipster flies by on a scooter, I'm like, we've got to ban those things, we have got to walk sidewalks, these crazy kids and their scooters. And, and both is true, right? Like both reactions and and the, and the reality, right, is that scooters are, are awesome additions to the multimodal transportation mix in our cities, but they need to be designed. They need to be designed in a way that's safe. They need to be designed that considers all of the different equities that are involved. And lots of people use sidewalks. You know, uh, the elderly use sidewalks. Families with kids use sidewalks. Disabled people use sidewalks. Um, scooters shouldn't use sidewalks. They should use protected bike lanes, but protected bike lanes don't exist everywhere, right? There's, there's a bunch of different issues involved, and the answer there, and I, I loved the rollout of the scooters because I felt like Bird and Lyft and their friends literally tried to use the Uber playbook for like four months, <laughs> got their asses handed to them, figured out it's a whole lot harder to hide a scooter on a city sidewalk <laughs> than it is to like sneak a you know, bunch of Ubers in a city, and have taken a vastly more collaborative tone since then. Right, and it, it almost feels like, in a certain sense, they're now competing for who can be more collaborative and who can engage more with cities because that's the only chance they have to really shape the regulatory environment to make sure that these both operate in the public interest and um, actually form a sustainable business model for these companies. The next step in that, though, is like self-driving cars, where I think the reality is um, you have an industry that is, and we were having a long conversation about this last night, right? where um, the technology probably isn't as ready as it should be. Uh, it's, it's not as ready as the industry often makes you think, but regardless of how good the technology gets, you're not going to see self-driving cars um, deployed in any sort of large-scale commercial environment until there is regulatory change. That's an example where an industry is going to actively have to bring regulation to the table or there isn't going to be a market because nobody knows what happens when somebody gets killed, right? And who do you sue is a really, really centrally important question in the formation of those markets. And so I think, you know, you've got three different, hey, great, we're going to revolutionize transportation examples and three completely different regulatory hacking approaches and strategies um, and how you apply them. Yeah. All right. Somebody back here. Yeah. To build on the previous question, um, what kind of incentives do you provide to ensure that the techniques provided uh, so just in your book, it's used by people with build good real and solve important problems. And then B, um, don't you think this regulations law is like way complicated, including the work that you're doing? How do we unpack it so that more people understand it, more people have access to it? So the first part of the question was, how do we ensure that only good people use these techniques? Or more good. More good people <laughs> use these techniques. The second question is, isn't the very need for my book a critique of how complex government is and we should we should figure out how to make it simpler and your work book is part of that work. yeah so the first part um i don't think you can i mean i think you you obviously have examples of people building new technology building technologies and building businesses that um i might personally find somewhat morally offensive and they're to a greater or lesser extent using techniques of regulatory hack to get it done in the same way that I think almost any good thing that startups and technology can do um, and you can apply it in bad and unhealthy ways. I, I don't think the answer is to say don't educate entrepreneurs about how to how to navigate complex <laughs> and sophisticated ways. I think the answer is to do exactly what we're doing right here. Go out and spend time talking with people um, that I certainly hope we're going to take these techniques and, and apply them in in good ways to do good things. At the end of the day, the book is not about how to get around government. The book is actually about collaborating with government. <clears throat> and um, I think you've got like, for exactly that reason, right? Like I, I would be someone that, for example, thinks, I'll, I'll pick a random example, like Jewel, Mm -hmm. um, figuring out how to like use new technologies to figure out how to get people to use nicotine again, like that's not something 
I find super positive. It's not something I'd want to invest in as an investor. It's not something I would want to advise or help. Um, and I think that's where, again, at some point, I suspect Juul is going to face the same kind of regulatory pressures that tobacco industry faced 20 years ago, um, because I don't think they're operating in the public interest, and I think they're probably doing things they shouldn't be doing. Right? That, that's why we need to have vibrant, strong governments that effectively represent the will of the people, is because um, there's a real role to play, and it's the interplay between innovators and entrepreneurs and, and private capital building and challenging things and government effectively representing the will of the people that I think arise at the best possible answers. All right, so let's see, we can get a couple more here. Uh, let's see, let's, uh, I can't really see, I, I want a, a woman that, somewhere back here. But, you are not a woman, I don't think. <laughs> not, I mean, do, we, do we have any, any, woman. any women? There we go. There we go. Hi, I can't, really can't so see, much. it's blinding. That's fine. I'm not seeing a lot of regulatory happening around methane, and it's a huge issue, especially in agriculture, sure. natural gas leakage. I mean, it seems like natural gas is no cleaner than coal. And so if we don't get this half right, nothing else will matter, because there's been a huge undercount of um, carbon dioxide emission, especially because of methane. And so we probably have a lot less time than we think we do. So I'm wondering, I don't, I'm not hearing a lot of people talking about this. So I'm wondering what's being done on the regulatory side for it, I, especially with the CPUC. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert in I, I'm actually an investor in a startup that's uh, uh, that's working in that space of, of looking at methane leaks from uh, natural gas uh, wells, and uh, they are in the middle of actually, you know, regulations changed. Uh, I don't know. Actually, that, that makes me think. I've got to make sure they get get a copy of your book because it may help help them. They have a technology where you know the way they find methane links right now is you, you drive around with a methane detector in a truck, you know, and they went, well, if actually we can build a much more sensitive methane detector, put it on a plane, fly overhead, uh, and uh, you know, huge uh, cost savings, but great impact on climate change, and and basically uh, uh, in the you know, current political environment, the, the EPA rules will roll back, and uh, there's much less incentive to do that. So there may, in fact, be uh, there may be some useful work. We should we should uh, great <laughs> get them a copy of the book. Great. <laughs> okay, straight back there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so was wondering if you could speak to one of the core problems of regulation is that. It's kind of inherently backward facing in most cases. We look back on a problem that existed before and we try to use that to make rules about future situations that haven't come up yet. And that's especially true with technology where a lot of startups are creating ideas that have never been seen before. So I was kind of wondering if you could speak to how technologists and people who are interested in these topics can share their expertise with regulators who may not have much idea at all of what kind of impact the technology is really Yes, your question was regulation tends to be kind of backward looking um, and technology moves forward and moves quickly. How do you educate and engage policymakers <laughs> around this stuff? Um, yeah, so, and so first the sort of regulation tends to be backward looking. Like, yeah, absolutely. And, and not just that, but I think one of the things that entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs who are super passionate about their idea at that moment in time, also tend to forget is that regulation tends to have to, uh, or at least good regulation, healthy regulation has to bring into consideration a lot of different equities in arriving at it. And so um, that example that I used about the scooters, I think is a, is a great one where um, it's very, very easy if you're a 25-year-old entrepreneur who thinks scooters are going to be the um, future of all transportation to get incredibly frustrated by why regulators are really concerned about a scooter blocking a sidewalk until you think about somebody who uh, maybe has limited mobility and it's not viable to go, oh, hey, I saw a scooter on the sidewalk. I'll just toss it off so I can walk past. And, and government has to take all that into consideration. I, I tend to think, and this is like, if I write a second book, I want it to be all on this topic, because this question of how do we regulate, how do we write regulation, I think is super fascinating, super, super important. And I, I actually think of regulation, you, you use the metaphor a lot of, of government as a, as a platform, right? The, well, also, can I jump in on yeah. this one? Because um, 
I wrote a piece, must be seven or eight years ago now, uh, for uh, maybe not quite that long, for a Coke America uh, for our article, uh, a book, book uh, about uh, what I called uh, algorithmic regulation. Yes. And I point out that, uh, you know, effectively Google runs a regulatory system. Uh, you know, uh, anti-spam is a regulatory system. And so tech has really gotten pretty good at the kind of real-time dynamic forward-looking regulation that you're talking about. Government has not. Uh, government tends to say, uh, you know, we're going to you know, have a bunch of detailed rules, uh, whereas if you think about search quality at Google, uh, they have a defined outcome, uh, which is something that I think Silicon Valley is pretty good at. They're going, we want people to click on the top result in, you know, in search. If they're not clicking on the top top result, we have to change the rules, uh, you know, which is i.e. The, the algorithm, all the factors that we're taking into account in the search results until we get the outcome we want. And you think about how different that would be, uh, you know, if in uh, you know in government regulations we went away from saying, well, we specified this list of rules 20 years ago, and every four or five years maybe we're going to revisit them instead of saying. Uh, you know, we, we have an outcome. Now, government occasionally gets that right. And a very good example is uh, the, I forget, it's, it's the credit, uh, I, I forget the name, it's the, the Credit Reporting Act of, uh, of you know, uh, sometime back in the 70s or whatever, where they basically said uh, consumers aren't responsible for credit card fraud, the credit card company is. <laughs> Uh, you know, and it's a simple regulation. They didn't say you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you have to do this. They just said, you know, consumers only all uh, liable for the first 50 bucks. And and the big regulatory system was actually built by the banks and credit card companies. They're the ones who do fraud detection. They're the ones who have all these rules. Now again, there's a lot of areas where then government gets back into the uh, either the they not having rules or having too many rules. But I think there probably are some really interesting ways that figuring out how to build regulation that's based on the outcome you're seeking rather than the set of rules that you think will achieve that outcome uh, is is uh, a big shift that I think we need to see in government regulation. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Okay, we only got one more question. Who's got the most burning question? So back over here. Yeah. So actually, one thing I wanted to say you were is waving your hand. That's why for you. <laughs> one of the comments I just wanted to say was that the FAA is actually doing a lot of really great work in using performance-based and result-based regulation for new technologies like drones, rather than being very prescriptive. But my question was actually about you mentioned earlier that um, it's in the interest of startups that are trying to work in these regular, highly regulated spaces to build narratives. They can build coalitions yep. to take on incumbents, right? And it seems to me that you know a lot of the examples that are in your book and the examples that people talk about are from a time when the incumbents were kind of unaware about the impact startups can have, or or would be or or could have been a little lazy or unaware about the power of narratives. But given things like your book and some of the impacts that startups have had. In the space now, do you think that we will have the same kind of luxury to pursue narratives unopposed for a period of time to build the kinds of coalitions that you think? Or do you think that people have woken up more in amongst these incumbents, who by the way typically have much more resources than startups would have to create you know uh, opposing narratives or build other kinds of coalitions? So to restate simply, um, are the incumbents getting a lot smarter about how to defend against and and respond to startups that maybe try to craft their own narratives and build their own coalitions to kind of combat them? Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, I think it's obviously I think it's pretty obvious that agricultural conglomerates, uh, major health systems. Um, oil and gas producers that might have thought all the startup stuff was completely irrelevant and interesting to them are paying more attention now than they were before and are probably investing more money in trying to engage with startups, acquire startups, work with startups. Um, the reality though is that um, I, I think the institutional forces that make it hard for 
you know, a massive uh, bureaucracy to respond to change are, are immense. Um, and so I, I remember um, we were doing a round table with um, one of the really senior people at McKinsey and one of our startups said, uh, maybe you can answer a question for me. Like, why are these big corporations that we're trying to disrupt <laughs> so like dumb? Like, we we broadcast so loudly. Like, we're coming, we're coming, we're coming. Here's what we want to do to you. Here's how we're going to transform the economics industry. And like, they don't really respond. And she and I, I'll never forget her answer. She sort of looks at him and she goes, well, "Let me." She goes, "I'm a I'm a senior partner, McKinsey. Like, I advise all these corporations." She goes, "Well, let me tell you like what my day is really like." And she, she goes through how much of her time is spent like doing an expense report and doing a quarterly budgeting process and doing it. And she literally goes through that. She goes, I, I spend like more than half my actual time just doing stuff necessary to keep the beast moving, right? She goes, do you know how much of my time I actually spend looking out into the world trying to understand, you know, where the gotchas and where the disruption points are going to come from? And I think you, you scale that up. Like, it's you, you could sit there and provide the perfect formula for most of these large corporations for exactly <laughs> how their demise will occur in minute and precise detail and doesn't mean that they can really do much about it. They might try to buy you, but they're not really <laughs> going to respond that way. So I'm, I'm and that, you know, this is a way, and you might have a different view on this, but like my overwhelming advice to almost all the startups that I've ever worked with, with very rare exceptions is like the whole idea of stealth mode is, is crazy. Like, if particularly if you're competing with or you're you're dealing with a large incumbent, like the benefits for you of getting your narrative right and getting it out there and building influence and building a coalition and attracting great talent vastly overweigh the risk that what you're doing is is so unique without stellar execution attached to it that. Um, simply getting the idea out there will cause a, a big corporation to have their epiphany and, and take it from you. Yeah, I forget who was it who said, uh, don't worry about people stealing your ideas. If they're any good, you're going to have to ram them down their throat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and build a coalition of people to help you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, with that, uh, I have two, two asks for you. One, um, uh, I want to just remind you all that Coach America is a nonprofit and uh, that our work is funded uh, by uh, people like you. And uh, so it, uh, do keep us in mind uh, if, if you uh, are in, in a charitable mood and, and if you know people who are, uh, remind them that we're doing good and important work. The second thing is that uh, Evan is kindly here to talk about his book. We actually have them for sale out there. And all of you are probably thinking, you know, I could get it probably cheaper on Amazon. <laughs> uh, and I always, I, I always like to remind people that um, uh, if you like browsing in bookstores, uh, you should pay for the privilege of browsing. Uh, the, the guy out here uh, sitting at a table out there is from a local bookstore that exists without the economics that Amazon has. Uh, part of what people buy from them is the book, and part of what they buy is the ability to walk in and, and buy a book. And that's the same reason why you come and pay more for a uh, coffee here at Manny's than you would pay for a coffee uh, that you brew for yourself at home. So uh, if you are going to buy the book, first of all, do buy it here. It is going to be more expensive than if you, if you ordered it on Amazon. Uh, but it is actually, in my mind, a civic thing to do. Uh, but more than that, I would just say, uh, you know, I, I, I thought I knew a lot of this stuff. But it was a, I got a lot out of, of this book, and I, I read it, uh, you know, in manuscript and you know, put a quote on the cover, but I, I'd forgotten a lot of what I learned, and I, I read it again to, to prep for this. And then I was like, oh, my God. I don't know why. I'm going to give this to my my uh, you know my government salespeople. Oh wait, I you know I'm going to give this to this startup. I'm going to give this to that startup. It's a really uh, uh, well articulated take on a lot of good strategic things that are that affect you if you're uh, you know in a business of any kind, and also if you're a civic hacker. I think you know all of us who are uh, doing this for the public good, not for profit. Uh, at Go to America also get a, a huge amount out of this because it really helps us to understand, oh, wait, you know, we need to think a little differently about where the leverage points are to achieve our objectives. And, and ultimately, uh, uh, that's what this is all about, uh, learning better 
on how to work with the government. So I recommend the book very highly, and I hope that some of you at least will uh, buy copies of it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few words before we uh, please stay and mingle, and there is some food in the back. Eat, 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 right? Um, uh, so I mentioned before, this is an event in, in a series, and I just want to thank Evan, not just for the great book um, and, and for the great lessons and for being here tonight, for, for, for sort of being one of those voices. Um, you know, one of the th many things he said tonight is, vibrant, strong government that represents the will of the people, like, hello. <laughs> uh, I think we could use more of that. And that just really places you in the context of um, all the people that we've ever invited to speak in this series. Um, one of the last event that we had in this series was with Anand Jirhardas, um, who wrote a book called Winners Take All that I got very excited about because he has this line, is the decrepit, sorry, decrepit state of American self-government an excuse to work around it and let it further atrophy, or is meaningful democracy in which we all potentially fight, uh, in which we all potentially have a voice worth fighting for? And you are part of that set of voices that is, you know, bringing in the digital age, bringing in what is going on in in in, in the 21st century, but making it relevant to this institution that matters to all of us. Um, years ago, we had another speaker, uh, well, two speakers, Nick Hanauer and Eric Liu, who talked about the gardens of democracy, and they talked about government that's big on the what and small on the how, which is another thing that I heard you talk about. So thank you for being part of this posse that cares about government that believes it's part of our future. Thank to all of you for being part of that. Um, and I just want to end on a, on a thank you to all the public servants in the audience. I know there's a couple over here from Sam and Bell, uh, Tali and Rebecca, but who else here is a public servant? Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you for the work you do. We appreciate it. And thank you all for coming tonight.